You're listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Madeleine Grant, Editorial Manager at the IEA. This week, the PM and her cabinet will gather in Chequers for a crucial summit and a meeting that will form the basis for a long-awaited white paper setting out a vision for the UK's future relationship with the EU. But what will they decide and what could it all mean for Brexit? Members of the IEA's International Trade and Competition Unit join us today to examine these possible outcomes, as well as some of the rumours swirling around Westminster. Senior Counsel Victoria Houston and Senior Policy Analyst Dr Radomir Talko give their red lines for any future deal and highlight the dangers of remaining too closely wedded to EU regulations and customs arrangements. Finally, they examine some of the possible implications for democracy in Britain. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes channel, IEA Conversations. Victoria, can you tell me why this is considered to be such a crucial time in the Brexit process? Yes, it does slightly feel like we've been here before because we already had a crunch checkers summit in February that at the time was thought to cover the ground that we are about to cover this time on Friday, which is to knock the cabinet's heads together and come up with a firm position on how we want the future relationship with the European Union to work. In that first Chequers summit in February, there was the big split, as it was portrayed in the media, between the aligners and the divergers. And it was reported after that that the the divergers, basically led by Boris Johnson, which means people who envisage the UK having full sovereignty and autonomy over our regulations and our tariff schedules, winning the day and having a, a, a relationship more like a normal free trade agreement than a Norway-style arrangement. It was reported that that side of the the debate had won in February, and that was then followed by the Prime Minister's speech in Florence that laid out a sort of high-level vision of how a relationship could work with advanced levels of cooperation, and we may choose to align in certain sectors. However, we've sort of ground back to a halt again, and seem now to be really retreading a very similar debate at Chequers on Friday. It's been reported that the aligners are back in control again. The aim of the Chequers meeting in in very sort of formal terms is to agree a government white paper to be produced next week that will set out for the purposes of the negotiation for the EU really as much as anyone what we will actually be looking for in the negotiations. So that's why it's so important and really why there's been so much pressure again on Again, these two sides, it it won't go away, the two sides, the divergers and the aligners. Yeah, particularly because they seem to have, I guess, re-clustered themselves around these two potential modes of departure, the MaxVac option and the so-called New Customs Partnership. And I think it might be useful if if one or both of you could briefly summarise what these things are, because I think it's been very difficult to follow along for ordinary people what this means. The two models that have been discussed and this debate has also been rumbling on for actually almost a year since the government published its first paper on a new customs relationship and by customs what we mean there is is tariffs the imposition of import duties and the associated paperwork with that it's an indirect tax matter associated with the imposition of tariffs is rules of origin compliance because in order to benefit from a zero tariff agreement you need to be able to prove that your goods actually come from the country that's a party to that agreement which is where rules of origin come in. The two options that the government put forward were ideas that would try and minimise the burden associated with instituting a, a customs border between the EU and the United Kingdom. The first option which has become to be known as MaxFAC, simply means using best practice technology processes and legal facilitations to make the process of filling in a customs declaration, calculating any duty due and getting the goods across the border as seamless as possible. And that's really how any two countries who are not in a customs union work. It's how the US and Canada works. It's how New Zealand and Australia work. They cooperate together and they use all kinds of techniques and technologies to, to make it as simple as possible for their traders. 
The other option seeks to avoid making customs declarations and rules of origin compliance at all between the UK and the EU because the UK would simply continue to apply the common external tariff on our borders for goods that are destined for the EU. And if we lower our own tariffs or if we reach an agreement with another country to lower tariffs between us and you import goods that are destined for the UK market, you would then claim back the difference between the EU's common external tariff and the lower or no tariff that the UK would have. Frankly, that's been widely criticised by businesses and people in trade as being virtually unworkable because at the point of import, you simply cannot prove where your good is going to land. In fact, the only person in a supply chain who will be able to prove where a good has landed is the ultimate retailer. So importers will simply have to suck up the higher tariff and hope that further down the line their end customer reclaims the difference. So for that reason it makes it very very difficult to sell to third countries whose exporters will not envisage that they'll get any benefit at all because their importers will continue to pay the common external tariff. There's also very serious difficulties with it from a WTO perspective. It would basically infringe um, all kinds of WTO rules as well. This points to what seems to be back on the table for checkers on Friday. We're hearing various rumours. What we're mainly hearing is that this seems to be a revamped form in some way of the NCP or New Customs Partnership, which we understand had been put to bed back in, what, early April. While on the one hand there seemed to be an idea of preferential rights for EU nationals to live in the UK, which is obviously inherently controversial, in terms of the, the core customs and regulation question, what we understand will be, will be presented at Chequers on Friday keeps the most problematic element of the NCP, and that's that the UK at its borders would collect tariffs on imports at the EU CEs, at common external tariff rate. Officially, although the UK would still have the capacity to negotiate free trade agreements with other countries and the the customs question would be solved because where tariffs were different, companies in the UK that were importing from third countries would be able to claim back the difference through HMRC. This is an extremely messy idea and there there are various reasons for this. First is it would be very difficult to operate that you're going to have large numbers of importers choosing, presumably, to pay a CET rate instead of going through the relevant paperwork. A good deal less incentive to negotiate lower tariffs for trade partners if their exporters can't receive the total benefit of those. The idea that was proposed before was that agriculture might be an exception because it would get bigger tariff reductions. These are sort of huge bureaucratic burdens that are building up. In practice, most importers and exporters just aren't going to know the specific product's actual destinations uh, for some time after import. This is something quite close then to a continuation of the customs union. This This is some form of partial customs union. I think it's fair to say we are looking at the presentation of a dog's breakfast on Friday. Is it fair to say that the deal that's been proposed is sort of 19 plus percent NCP, 10 percent minus max fact. So in some ways, it's not really a compromise between the two warring factions at all. I mean, we don't, we don't know what's going to be proposed, and we, we can only go on what we see and read. But the I Robert mean, Peston stuff, for example. Well, this seems very close to the NCP concept. I would say that, as reported by Robert Peston, it was described as a sort of... Third way. A revamped version of NCP. It's not revamped in any operative way at all. The main functional aspect of it, that you retain the EU's tariff and eventually try and reclaim the difference, is is in place, as reported by Peston. Obviously, as Radu says, we don't know if that yeah. is in fact what's going to be on the table at Chequers on Friday. I think it's worth highlighting another aspect of this, which is that the NCP idea, or whatever this is going to be called, claims to deal with tariffs. It's very important to keep in mind the regulatory aspect of that. There is also at the border a question of the the regulatory compliance of goods. The implication is that this will have to be accompanied by agreement on regulatory alignment. 
if we are to operate that customs border in an NCP type setting. And then we are approaching serious questions of red lines. After the last checkers meeting, we heard in the PM's um, Mansion House speech that we would not need regulatory alignment, we'd simply need the alignment of aims, which is quite standard, that's quite plain vanilla. This would be a problem for that red line. It seems to me that the PM's line here has been effectively a gamble that her recalcitrant Brexiteer faction will take this deal because the alternative is even worse. This deal or you end up with something even closer to the EA, the EFTA type deal. This certainly has been suggested in various political gossip outlets that this is really a a bit of game theory going on here. The more pro-Brexit, pro-divergence, pro-autonomy cabinet members and MPs are really going to have to take a serious decision here as to accept this very suboptimal approach from their perspective or perhaps we don't leave at all because Parliament won't accept a no deal and will instruct the Prime Minister to withdraw the Article 50 notice, which, of course, brings us back to last week's discussion about the the, the meaningful vote. A very important factor that is slightly neglected in all of this discussion about checkers and about the NCP and about the alignment is there are two sides in this negotiation and we are still negotiating with ourselves here. It feels a little bit like the proposition that might emerge in the white paper will be potentially not remotely acceptable to the EU who may well say, well, actually, you can stay in the single market in full and you can stay in the customs union, but you cannot break up the single market and cherry pick between the four freedoms as as potentially the white paper will, will seek to do. The option then might be stay in the single market and customs union, which isn't really leaving the EU no. at all. It would be very difficult to sell that to both her cabinet and the wider which, electorate. Which conversely then potentially raises the spectre of of a no deal if that ends up being the the alternative that the EU puts forward. Well, in some ways, we've seen this before from the EU. When David Cameron initially went to Brussels to negotiate some reforms long before the referendum, in that they gave him very, very little, and it meant that he had very little to sell, and it certainly weakened the hand of the Remain camp because they were so confident that the British public would vote to remain. It's certainly a strange way to approach a negotiation, I would have thought, to put forward a position that isn't really your own first choice position in the first place. It's a, a messy bundle of compromises from your own side. If you go into a negotiation expecting that the other side is going to be pretty tough, then at least put forward something that you actually want. (laughs) (laughs) Quite. I mean, there's another strategic point here as well. Firstly, other future trading partners, Canadians, Australians, US, have said they are not interested in doing free trade deals with a UK that continues with EU harmonisation of regulation. So we're only thinking about the current negotiation right now, or rather that's, that's a good deal of what's being discussed. But this goes back to what Victoria said as well. If you ask for little, you will get little. And I think the most important acceptance now is that the great game ahead of us in terms of economic growth, in terms of making our country and others more wealthy, is the opportunity to reform our regulation to make our domestic economy more competitive. And that just cannot be off the table. If you accept that as a red line, then you will not respond with such fear to every complaint that comes out of Brussels, because you will understand that the opportunity for a more competitive economy vastly outweighs any border barriers that may be created by the EU. And that's your starting point. And then you have a different negotiation. Could one of you briefly outline precisely why it would be so, in your view, problematic to remain in A or the customs union? We talked about regulatory alignment already. How exactly would all of these things prevent us from striking new trade deals? So when two countries or two parties like the EU want to trade better and more efficiently and more freely with each other, they enter into a a, a negotiation to remove their respective barriers that that each side has that might prevent goods and services entering each other's markets in the most efficient way. And the most obvious barrier that, for example, the EU has is the common external tariff, which is the import duties on goods that come into the territory. And some of them are really very high. And unless you're a very 
per country that benefits from a zero rated preference scheme, then the, the, the tariffs on agriculture, food, cars, are, you know, really key products for normal people, normal consumers, as well as operators in the supply chain are very high. If you do not have the ability as a sovereign country to reduce and eliminate those tariffs for products coming into your market, there is no country who will be interested in doing a free trade deal with you. There's been some speculation that perhaps you could have a customs union so your goods market is locked into the EU, but you pursue services liberalisation, which is, of course, as we know, around 80% of the UK's economy and one of our great export strengths. But the idea that a country is going to give you what you want from its market in services without you being able to give it what it wants for access to your market for its goods exports is yeah. just absurd. And our trade experts who are on our advisory board from, from countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Mexico have made very clear that it would be seen as laughable by trade negotiators in, in those countries and in the WTO. Not, it seems widely enough known. There's another question to continuing harmonisation with regulation, which is that, what are the mechanics of this? By accepting alignment with the EU regulations themselves, it strikes me that you're implicitly saying, we would rather have this regulation made in a closed and undemocratic system rather than with the full oversight of the parliamentary system. Definitely a democratic red line, because that's EU lawmaking continuing. It's also a question of why would you assume that a regulation made by that system would be better? Or any good at all. Or any good at all. There's example after example. I mean, this year we have, in the last two years even, we have MIFID II, Solvency II, GDPR, of highly uncompetitive regulations that are very bad for small firms. And it's not coincidental that these have been made in a system that is excellent for incumbent access and very bad for transparency and oversight. But it would get worse because after... Brexit, whatever form it takes, the UK would not have formal representation in these institutions. So we would be depending on these institutions continuing to make rules in any national interest for the UK at all. And that's the implication here. It's We will vaguely hope that these rules will be in our national economic interest rather than simply making them in a transparent parliament. There's a fundamental democratic question. So you'd end up with a situation where it was delivering Brexit but without any of the freedoms and advantages, but with all of the potential pitfalls that come with EU membership. That's exactly right. And it's, you know, it's it's even arguable that we would be better off staying in as a, as a member than this sort of Brexit in name only. And there are some people who have argued or suggested that perhaps if we did have some kind of alignment arrangement or as a, even as an EEA member, you have some rights of consultation and you still have influence. That's just simply not the case Window at all. Dressing. After EEA members like Norway are sort of consulted at an early stage as the EU embarks on a, a process of lawmaking, but they have they have no vote, they have no real influence at all. And in fact, if they do wish to participate in the lawmaking process as a, as a law goes through the European Parliament, they have to try and find friendly MEPs from EU member states who will speak up for them. And the idea that we as, as the UK, as the, you know, the fifth biggest economy in the world and one of the EU's biggest trading partners should, should be reduced to that is horrifying. I guess another element of all of this that I'm quite interested in in is what a any kind of compromise or you know let's call a spade a spade a big fudge driving us towards a an ever softer brexit i'm quite interested in what that could do to our democracy because i think there could be a very strong sense of betrayal if we end up going down that road i think many who voted leave would feel that they had been sold out by the elites they'd been you know stitched up and i think it'd be really bad for public trust in institutions and their general demos well let's just go through the list would we have control over our money through the NCP? No, because we're still making real contributions to a, a sort of central customs pot, if you like, in the EU. So no, no control over money. We may or may not have control over our borders, although if there's, there is a preferential system of EU nationals being able to settle in the UK, debatable. If we have de facto alignment with regulation, if we, we have to align 
with EU regulation that we no longer have an influence on, we haven't taken back control of our laws. So yeah, there are very fundamental questions at stake here, and there's another one. This has already been rejected. This has been rejected by the cabinet. What is happening now is a kind of strange game of bureaucratic whack-a-mole, whereby these ideas seem to disappear and they they reappear with a new title. Cabinet government is a part of our our democratic system. Again, there's another there's another fundamental question about democracy. Yeah. Also, I think worth highlighting that we've had the local elections earlier this year. We had last year's general election. Parties that favoured at the time a hard Brexit or Brexit generally won something like 80% plus of the electorate. Now, that is a pretty clear mandate that we have to do this thing. I think that's that's right. And, and polling still, I think, broadly shows that while not many people who voted Remain have changed their minds as to how they would have voted, most Remain voters do still support fulfilling the referendum outcome and getting on with it, basically. And the other democratic aspect is, in fact, Parliament has debated staying in the single market, staying in the customs union. And those amendments that were put forward to the withdrawal bill were defeated. It would be very tight, of course, but I think we have shown, or the government has shown, that when it came down to it, with 250 plus hours of debate on all of these matters, Parliament passed the withdrawal bill without any requirement for a single market or customs union. Do you guys agree with me that that might lead to a really strong sense of betrayal, that people would feel that they could no longer trust the democratic process and that they could potentially no longer trust key institutions in public life? I I think that would, would certainly be the case. You know, the very fact that for a generation there has been a consensus within Parliament of staying in the European Union and when eventually it was put to a vote of the people, it was pretty clear that a majority of the actual electorate of this country wanted to leave and if we end up having that overridden and the the remain pro-EU consensus baked in again I think that would be very serious for our democracy. I think one way it was put to me long before the referendum by a a solidly uh, classical liberal member of parliament with our politics in the European Union it started to feel for the electorate like when you went to the polls you pulled a lever but nothing happened because the lever was broken and Levers have been pulled here by the electorate and by Parliament, and it needs to be clear that the machine works. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. For more podcasts, blogs, reports and films, go to our website, iea.org.uk.